Hello, everybody. I'm back. This is Bonnie Squires, the host of Bonnie's Beat. And I was out of commission for a few months, but it's very nice to be back. And I'm at Radnor Studio 21, which has changed its name to MLTV Mainline Network. And I'd like to interview people who are stars, either in academia or philanthropy or athletics or prize-winning novelists. And I've got somebody very special today for you to learn about. Her name is Dr. Meryl Littman. She's not a doctor, a doctor like at Penn Radner. She's at Penn Veterinary School, or had been for what, 32 years? 38. 38 years, but who's counting, Meryl, right? <laughs> anyway, so um, Meryl Littman, she's a longtime friend and a former neighbor. We're Lower Murrayanites, so we have to put in a plug for Lower Murrayan. Anyway. Bonnie, I'm so glad you're back. 38 years you were at Penn? Yes. Yeah. I, I'm wearing my pussycat pin today, people, because anytime I had a problem with one of my cats, or one of them threw up, or one of them didn't look so good. I'd call Merrill, and then I'd bring him down to Penn Veterinary Hospital. The, uh, oh, um, the full name of the veterinary hospital is somebody Ryan. What was his first name? <laughs> um, the veterinary school is named for, he had been the speaker of the Pennsylvania House, and he put enough money in the budget that, uh, in response, and in gratitude, they named it the something Ryan Veterinary Hospital. Mm -hmm. I can't think of his first name. I can picture him so. He's long gone, but he was a terrific guy. Yeah. Even though he was a I Republican. I think of it as Penn Vet. Yes, Penn Vet. <laughs> anyway. But, yeah, So Ryan. you were a, a clinician educator. educator. Right. Explain what that means. So there are different tracks uh, in the academia. Uh, most of us are specialists in our area, so when people go to veterinary school, uh, they could just go out after graduation and become a general practitioner. Or if they wanted to go a little bit further, they could do an internship. And if they wanted to go even further and specialize, they could do a residency. So I did an internal medicine residency, but there are a lot of different residencies. People uh, might choose to go into large animal medicine or large animal surgery or small animal uh, surgery or they might want to become an ophthalmologist, a cardiologist, a neurologist. Because animals have the same problems humans have. That's right. It's one medicine, right? One health. <coughs> they might want to go into zoo medicine or exotics. And, and then if they work for academia, there are different tracks that they could go into to um, become tenure track if they want to do a lot of research and get grants uh, and have most of their time for research or if they want to have most of their time in in the clinics that would be a different track and that's the one that I took clinician educator track most of the people that go into tenure track in addition to having their veterinary degree also have a PhD graduate degree so they're very special people yeah, but you're special, Meryl. I'm special in my <laughs> track, right, clinician educator track. And then there are also um, other clinicians uh, in, in other tracks. There are nurses, technicians. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to use the degree uh, when students go to veterinary school. So it's an exciting, I had a, an exciting career. And I retired a couple years ago, so now I'm too a young, professor too emerita. Young to, too young to be retired. You went to Bryn Mawr College. When you enrolled at Bryn Mawr College, what did you think you were going to major in? So not many women went to veterinary school back then. This was in the 70s. And I thought I would be a geometry teacher. I love geometry and math. And I was starting to major in math at Bryn Mawr. And then I realized that I, um, I came to a wall of how creative I was in math. <laughs> and so I switched to biology, and I loved the diversity of life 
and I love thinking about the evolution and the way that each species is adapted, especially for its, you know, special niche in the world. And so I realized that uh, maybe I could try to get into veterinary school. The years before I went to veterinary school, there were only two women a year. And two a year? Yeah. Oh. And so it was hard for women in the 70s to picture themselves. They didn't have examples. They didn't have mentors to. But at Bryn Mawr College, I, I felt, you know, encouraged to do anything. And uh, so I applied and I got in. And my year, there were 20% of the class was women. And, uh, and now it's flipped so that usually 80% of the class is women. It's funny because I take my cats to the Bryn Mawr Veterinary Hospital, and now three young women who are all graduates of the Penn Vet, mm -hmm. they now own it, mm -hmm. and they're the doctors. Right. Very interesting. And that's true at all of the veterinary schools. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's funny because math was always my weakest A at Lower Murray, and if I had had to take an advanced math course, I'd still be in high school. I never would have gotten out. <laughs> I love math because the, there are theorems, and you know that a squared plus b squared always equals c squared. It was, you know, really nice. I always would ask the, the teachers, what does x stand for? They could never tell me what x stood for. So that's what you need to find out. Right? Yeah, but I was never thrilled with with um, algebra, oh, horrible, horrible, horrible. <laughs> anyway, okay, so how did you get into doing research on diseases that affect animals, but they also affect people? Right, so I, um, in my role as clinician educator, I was in the clinics most of the time, seven, eight months a year, but there would be some months that I was able to study the clini clinical cases that I was seeing to look for patterns or to see if there was something special that we could study about them. And uh, I was very lucky to fall into a question that I was able to answer after 30 years, and it involved Wheaton Terriers and the soft... What do Wheaton Terriers look like? I'm not a dog person. I'm a cat person. That's why I'm wearing my pussycat pin today. I should have brought a picture. They're lovely, and you can Google soft-coated Wheaton Terrier. They're a little bit smaller than Airedales, and they have very soft fur, and um, they're beautiful dogs. Um, but they were having troubles. Uh, they were dying when they were only five years old with a variety of, of problems. And this particular dog that I saw in the clinic in 1983 had a, uh, an intestinal problem called protein-losing enteropathy. And when I told the owner, who happened to be a breeder, um, the diagnosis, she said, you know, her aunt had the same thing. And I said, that's really interesting. I want to know more. Send me the records so that I can see if it really was the same thing. And so they sent me records, and pretty soon the word got out among the breeders that I was interested in knowing about these dogs. And I started getting a lot of records, and we also started to save DNA samples from dogs. And um, we also saved DNA samples not just from the dogs that were sick, but from their healthy relatives that lived until they were full lifespans, 14 years and up. And um, it turned out that uh, among these dogs that were sick, the breeders were having some confusion as to whether they really had the same disease. And it turned out that they had, were coming in with similar signs of illness, like vomiting or drinking too much water or you know things like that. And it turned out that really they were confusing five different diseases. Five. Five. So we kind of figured that out pretty early, and it was protein-losing enteropathy, protein-losing nephropathy, which is a kidney problem, Addison's disease, which is an endocrine problem of the adrenal glands. People have Addison's right? disease. Right. JFK had it, uh, renal dysplasia, and food allergies. Oh. And when we figured that out and we made sure what DNA sample was from which phenotype, which kind of disease, 
uh, eventually, in 2010, we were able to do a genome-wide association study. I worked with a geneticist at Penn, Paula Henthorne, and she was able to find a DNA test that helped for one form of this problem, the protein-losing nephropathy, the kidney problem. So now we have a DNA test that the breeders can use to know which dogs they shouldn't breed to each other because that ah. might produce this problem. Ah. So it was a really good feeling after all those years to find a, an answer, and uh, they still need to work on the other problems. Uh, Is there a cure, though? There are, I wouldn't say cure, but there are management regimens and there are screening tests to look at, at the dog's blood and urine samples when it's uh, relatively young to see whether it looks like it's starting to have warning flags that it might be affected. And right away we would start the intervention and that's the best time to get things stabilized so that it won't progress as fast. With your home, what animals have you had through the years as pets? So I've had, uh, my parents didn't really want to start with dogs and cats, and we didn't live on a farm, so I was mostly into parakeets and turtles and guinea pigs and small things. Um, and then uh, when my husband and I got married, we got two cats. And then my husband became allergic to cats. Oh, you're so kidding. We yeah, had, I was allergic. Oh. So then we had children. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had dogs. And so we've, we've had dogs. And what kind of dogs? Labradors. We really like Labrador retrievers. We had two of those, black and yellow. How, lo how long did they live? Uh, 15, 15 That's years old. That's long yeah. for a dog. Yeah. And then we also we got a Cocker Spaniel from my niece. Uh, she couldn't keep. And um, a wonderful owner left me her toy poodle in her will. So we had in that her dog. will. <laughs> yeah, I told her, Mary, you know, you have to get another dog. You know, and if anything happens to you, I'll take the dog. So we had Renee, <laughs> and um, and now we have a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier. Finally, we oh. we got our own soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, and we have a Portuguese water dog. So, They're big, the Portuguese water dogs. Yeah, she's, she's around 55 used... pounds, but not like our Labrador was 90, one of them. Yeah. They must eat like horses at 90 pounds. <laughs> not like horses. <laughs> well, I should tell you my other big project through my career was about tick-borne diseases, and that'll be important to the listeners about uh, tick-borne disease, Lyme disease. And so a lot of the speaking that I give around the country uh, is about Lyme disease. And I talk about Lyme disease in dogs. Uh, there was a panel that wrote up the consensus statement in 2006 about Lyme disease in dogs, the diagnosis, the prevention, um, and we updated that in 2018. So when I'm asked to speak, uh, and you're often asked to speak. I you like just teaching. I really do. Where were you recently? You were out of town. I was in Michigan. Uh, we went to Traverse City and Lansing and Brighton and Dearborn. And we saw, you know, we always like to stop off at nice places wherever we're sent. And um, luckily, my husband and I now can travel and and see these different areas. But New York, uh, you know, around the uh, Canal is beautiful, um, beautiful areas of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New England. So it turns out there are a lot of Lyme endemic areas. In fact, oh. we went to Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. They have a problem with Lyme up there um, because the ticks are, are being uh, brought by birds, migrating birds, to new areas. And so these Lyme endemic areas are spreading north, more north than you'd think. Maine is in trouble. Um, and so I often send owners that have Lyme positive dogs to the CDC.gov website to learn more about how they should uh, do landscaping on their property and how they can prevent Lyme disease in themselves. Because if your dog is Lyme positive, then you know that you live in a Lyme endemic area and your dog is a sentinel for the fact that you could be exposed yourself. What are the symptoms when 
a human being gets Lyme disease. I know it's hard to diagnose because it emulates a few, a few other diseases. Well, I, I'm not going to talk about people because I'm not a oh, human okay, doctor. Right. <laughs> but I can tell you for dogs what the signs are. And it turns out that most dogs, 90, 95 percent of the dogs that get exposed to Lyme become Lyme positive, but they don't get sick at all. So they don't show a rash, they don't get arthritis, they don't, you know, show cardiac or neurologic problems like people do. They are Lyme positive, which means that they have antibodies to Lyme. And um, luckily, they don't get sick. But there are a few, about 5%, 5 to 10% might get arthritis from Lyme. And it might be one joint, might be multiple joints, depending how many ticks, you know, were biting them. How would you know if a dog has arthritis? Uh, well, they're, if they have acute arthritis, they're limping, and they're oh, not okay. using that leg. And it turns out in the studies that they did at Cornell that the leg that they're lame in is the one that's closest to where the tick had attached. Uh, but, Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But if the owners aren't using some kind of tick prevention, uh, dogs out there might be getting multiple tick bites, and so they might oh. have lameness in multiple legs, right? Um, and then about 2 percent of dogs that are exposed to Lyme a disease may get a, a serious kidney problem, which is part of the protein-losing nephropathy complex, and so I also studied that. And uh, it turns out Labradors that? and Golden Retrievers are more uh, susceptible to that. How would you how would you study that? I mean, what? It's what hard you... because there's no experimental model, because the beagles that were studied at Cornell didn't get uh, Lyme nephritis. It's called Lyme nephritis, and so it, it's hard to study um, because if a dog is Lyme positive on its diagnostic test, meaning it's been exposed and it has antibodies. If it also has protein-losing nephropathy, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Lyme caused it. It could be that it's got another disease that is causing it, and it's just a coincidence that it's Lyme positive. But we certainly treat it for Lyme disease, if that's, if that's what we're saying. If there are any signs of arthritis or kidney problems, uh, and the dog is Lyme positive, we're going to treat it. But there's a controversy debate as to whether you need to treat a Lyme positive dog that's not showing any clinical signs and doesn't have protein in its urine. Then um, there's a debate. And uh, if we were to treat all of those dogs that are Lyme positive, we would be treating dox you know, with doxycycline for a month uh, to too many dogs. So my feeling, and a lot of the people in the panel, was not to treat them. And but the medicine's expensive, right? I don't know that it's expensive, um, because you can use generic doxycycline or minocycline. Um, but um, you mentioned genomes, and a classmate of mine at Penn, Bev Willis, I'm trying to remember what her, what her married name is. That was her maiden name. But she was like in the vanguard of uh, genome studies at Penn. So, whom do you coordinate with when you find something with dogs that you find will will be relevant to treat humans? So, Paula Henthorn was the geneticist that I worked with. Uh, Maggie Casal is another geneticist there. Um, Urs Giger was active for years. I think he's retiring this year. Um, and um, yeah, there there are plenty of diseases that mimic uh, what's going on with people. So I picture uh, for the protein losing enteropathy problem in the Wheatons, this could be a model for Crohn's disease or oh. problems with chronic diarrhea in people. And so they'll be looking at the DNA in the dogs for the 200 suspect genes, you know, that they found in people to see whether there's a particular problem in one of those genes. There's, there's a lot of work to be done, but um, someone else is running with that ball. But to get back to, the, you know, what to do with a Lyme-positive dog that is not showing any signs of illness, 
they still need to be screened frequently to see if they have any protein in their urine because that's a serious manifestation, this Lyme nephritis, if it's happening in the dog, and you need to look for that. And also, I, I put these dogs on tick prevention because evidently whatever the and What people, does tick prevention mean? So we want to try to keep our dogs away from tick areas in the environment, if we can, to keep them out of bushes and leaf litter and places that ticks um, will be. But we can also, there are a lot of products that we can use to prevent tick attachment on the dogs. Um, there are um, products that can be put on the skin every month. There's collars, as long as they're on tightly enough to have contact with the skin, uh, that work really well. And there are now chewables that can be given. My dogs love the taste of these. So, Isn't that interesting? Um, and some of the chewables work for a month and others work for three months. So that really helps owners try to keep things under control. And we need to use them in this area all year round because it turns out that the ticks are active whenever the temperature is greater than 40 degrees. Oh. And so sometimes in January or February, that's it right. could be a, a, a day that's a little warm and the ticks can be active again. So it's important to keep the, the tick control going all year round. What was the most challenging case you ever encountered in your 38 years at Penn Vet? Hmm. Most challenging case. Gosh. Or most unusual case or... Unusual. Did people ever bring dogs or cats to you? And you discovered that the, the animal was pregnant and the owner didn't know that the animal was pregnant. Sure. And that was the problem? Um, if dogs are starting to get swollen in their belly, um, there are different things that that could be. <laughs> and, you know, we usually, we would talk about the five, five Fs. It could be fetus. It could be fat. It could be fluid. It could be flatus, which is gas. And it could be the effing mass, <laughs> which is a mass is, um, you know, it could be that the spleen has a tumor on it Ooh. or there's, uh, you know, something that has uh, grown as an enlargement there. But um, most of the cases that I saw had to do with uh, drinking too much water or uh, urinating too much, uh, throwing up or having diarrhea. Um, and having problems with uh, suspected Lyme disease. And uh, most of the cases that I saw at Penn had already seen local veterinarians, and the owners uh, wanted another opinion, or the veterinarians would refer them because it was something unusual. So I would say a lot of our cases are, are unusual, and we're lucky to have ultrasound and, uh, you know, MRIs and beyond the blood and urine tests and cultures and biopsies. You oh, know, I know about x-rays. There's a lot of, uh, you know, helpful specialists in all of these different areas that helped us to make a diagnosis and helped with the treatment. My one genius cat, Homer, at five developed a mess cell something or other, which was very unusual for a cat that young. Mm. And we have oncologists. Yeah. And uh, took him down to Penn Vet, and they did exploratory surgery, but they discovered that whatever this was, it was everywhere. Ah. There was no saving him. Mm. So my husband and I went down to say our farewells to the cat, and for 30 minutes, the cat talked to me. Mm. And when Homer was finished meowing, and he had like 12 different sounds. He shoved his little head under my armpit, and I got a beautiful letter from the vet who was in charge at the time, who said, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I never would have believed that a cat could communicate like that. He wrote this beautiful letter, but by the next day, you know, the cat died on the operating table. Oh, broke my heart. But that was my genius cat. Now I've got two, they're not called alley cats because my dear friend, Ferris Wilson, who had fancy cats, 
she had Burmese cats, and she would cook liver for them every morning. Yeah. I don't cook anything for my cats. <laughs> they wait for me. They like the can opener sound, okay? And um, they're just delicious and wonderful, but uh, we don't tell them that they're not brother and sister because we got them from Buzzy's Bow Wow Meow, you know. And uh, the ACCT had brought some kittens. So we got the little girl and the little boy cat. And they love each other. But periodically, the boy cat, who's big and fat, he'll jump on the girl cat. And she doesn't run away, but she howls and she yells at him and she, you know, pats him and scratches him. It doesn't hurt him, but. Well, there's another specialty group at Penn, and they're behaviorists. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really uh, happy that I was able to work uh, at my career at Penn Vet. Very proud of that place. You also taught a lot of students. Mm -hmm. So is there someone who succeeded you as a clinician educator? Do you know? Not a particular person. Um, you know, they put out, uh, you know, the search committees and, uh, you know, it's a growing uh, area, internal medicine. And, uh, you know, How there many? are generalists and there's also an endocrinologist, Rebecca Hess. There's a hematologist, Beth Callen. There's a GI person, Mark Rondeau. Um, but we all work together and, uh, you know, it's a great group. How many staff people are there? Oh, I don't know. Because it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, they have a wonderful uh, emergency room. Oh, I should tell what the the phone number is, 215-898-4680. Let's t tell people that again. The phone number, for if you need to make an appointment to take your, your pet down to Penn Veterinary Hospital, it's 215-898-4680. But you won't find Merrill Littman there, That's unfortunately. Right. That's right. But if you'd like me to talk with your group, <laughs> get a hold of Bonnie Squires, <laughs> I guess, and she'll get a hold of me. But I'm still teaching, and I still do consultations online, uh, working with the veterinarian who's actually examining the pet. And we work together, and you know, I might give my opinion as to other diagnostic tests or other treatments they might try. What do you see? Every once in a while on television, you see a horror story of somebody who was a hoarder and they take 15, 20 animals, half of them are dead or near death. How could that happen? It's a shame, yeah. It's, um, it's often more than 15. You know, we, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's definitely a problem because it's hard to take care of animals uh, when you know, one, one or two people and there's that many yeah. at home. Well, our guest today has been Dr. Merrill Littman from Penn Veterinary Hospital, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks so much, Merrill. Thanks, Bonnie. Glad you're well. <laughs>